The thrilling first season of Shadow and Bone is stacked with Easter eggs, secret cameos, and hidden clues, revealing what we can expect in future seasons of the show. Yippee Kai, movie lovers, I'm Jan, and in this video, I'm revealing 27 crucial details you missed in Shadow and Bone and how they affect season 2 and beyond. Spoilers for the TV show and books ahead. The Crows are arguably some of the biggest fan favourite characters in the Grishaverse, and the show made sure that Kaz and Inej deliver one of their most famous phrases from the novels. No one's dying today. No mourners. No funerals. In the books, the idea behind this expression is that it's another way of saying good luck before undertaking a dangerous endeavour, somewhat similar perhaps to the phrase not today from another fantasy epic Game of Thrones. What do we say to the god of death? Not today. No Mourners is also the title of the episode finale, a shout out that book fans will appreciate given that all the main characters survive crossing the fold in that episode, even the Darkling aka General Kirigan. Many of the other episode titles are also nods to the books. For example, the seventh episode is titled The Unsea, an alternate name used for the Shadow Fold in the novels. And it's in that episode where we go back several centuries to learn about the events that led to the Fold's creation. If you find the geography of Shadow and Bone a lot to take in, then it's worth having a look at the map of the Grishaverse, which you can find on Bardugo's official website. In the show, you can spot that map framed on the wall inside Kaz's office, just behind his desk, where it also serves to hide his safe of valuables. Also near that map is the stolen decapel painting that Rotty was asking Kaz about in the first episode. The thief had to get past four roving guards, high fences, padlock doors, and a security system designed by one of them Russia witches. The reason for this name drop isn't just to show what an expert thief Kaz is, it's also setting up the heist that Kaz is recruited for in the Six of Crows book, where the merchant Van Eck, who Kaz stole the decapel painting from in the first place, hires Kaz for a job to kidnap a shoe scientist who developed a Grisha drug called Jordan. Parham. And the Jordan plant, which Jordan Parham is made from, is also mentioned later in the show when the conductor names it as one of the ingredients he needs for the trip across the fold. To cross, I need 20 pounds of alabaster coal, a pack of Mejdalune Jorda, not the kind from Kurtz, it's too weak. We can see how the Decapel and the Jorda mentions in this first season may be setting up the Jordan Parham plot for either season 2 or a spin off series for the Crows. Lee Bardugo, author of the Shadow and Bone trilogy, the Six of Crows duology, and the wider Grishaverse book series, has been heavily involved in the TV adaptation. And on top of that, the best selling author made a secret cameo in the third episode of season one. Bardugo is dressed in a purple Juras fabricator kefta, and she's the first Grisha to hug Alina after her successful display of sun summoning powers at the Rafkin court. And one of Bardugo's books, The Lives of Saints, makes a brief appearance too as the book that the Apparat gives to Alina in the Palace Library. A gift to mark our new friendship. The Lives of the Saints. As well as being a real world book that Bardugo wrote as a companion to the Grishaverse, The Lives of Saints is also an in universe compilation of stories about Ravka's legendary saints that will come in handy for Alina in later seasons as she learns more about Ilya Moritzova and his amplifiers and discovers that one of the illustrations of Saint Ilya in the book reveals some crucial information information about him. The quest for Moritzova's stag and its antlers, which the Darkling uses as an amplifier on Alina, are a big part of the final two episodes of the first season, with Kirigan binding himself to the antlers and Alina through a Grisha ritual. An intriguing detail is that the antlers being fused to Alina's neck and her forced connection to Kirigan was foreshadowed right back in the first episode, when Alina's on the skiff about to enter the fold for the first time, and her scarf blows off from around her neck and the wind takes it back towards Kirigan. Alina losing the scarf could also be a reference to how in the book she uses a scarf to cover up Moritzova's collar. In the TV show, Alina won't need a scarf to cover up the antler collar because she breaks the Darkling's control over her and also because after that she absorbs the antlers into her body. Talking of amplifiers, Moritzova's stag also appeared on the pages of the book that the Apparat showed to Alina. The other two creatures on this page are two more fabled beasts and living amplifiers that we can expect to appear in the show's second and subsequent seasons. First is the Sea Whip, a dragon prince said to be cursed to live as a sea serpent in waters known as the Bone Road. Bone Road ebbs and the Bone Road flows. And notice how in this scene the Apparat is standing in front of a picture of what looks like some kind of boat, pointing to the sea journey I expect Alina will go on in the second season in search of the Sea Whip. The other creature is the Firebird, a mythical beast considered crucial to the identity of the Ravkin nation, and reputed to be the third amplifier created by Moritzova. 
The hunt for the Firebird will likely be in the third season or later, depending on how the showrunner decides to continue adapting the Grishaverse trilogy, given the first season also added in characters from the Six of Crows duology. The TV show's depiction of the fold and the murderous Volcra beast has been pretty impressive, as getting CGI creatures to look good can be tricky, especially on TV budgets. VFX supervisor Ted Ray was visually inspired by gargoyles and demons for the look of the Shadowfold monsters, and there's a shout out to that when the Darkling stands right between two gargoyle-like statues, as he calls on the forbidden Merzost magic that ends up creating the fold and the Volcra. A vital member of the Crows crew will also be Nina, who meets Kaz, Inej and Jesper at the end of Season 1. I have a plan. We're gonna need a heart render. As a Grisha spy, Nina can speak six languages, and there's a fun moment earlier on when, as she describes the Wandering Isle to Matthias, she slips into an Irish accent. Oh, the Wandering Isle? Well, I can fit in there, no trouble. This is a reference to how the Wandering Isle in the Grishaverse is based on Ireland, and it's also a nod to the fact that the actress who plays Nina, Danielle Gallagher, is Irish herself. There's a nice moment during Nina and Matthias' enemies turn lovers storyline when Nina gets to enjoy some waffles with the burly Fjordan. Book readers will know that Nina is obsessed with waffles. I can't wait to introduce you to my truest love. And her love for the battered treats would probably even rival any romantic feelings she has for Matthias. Is this supposed to be sweet or savory? Yes. These next few Easter eggs include spoilers for the ending of the book, so if you want to avoid these, you can skip them by going to the timestamp on screen. Although the Darkling appears to be immortal, he is eternal. In the final episode, Inej manages to throw one of her daggers straight into his chest. Kirigan, however, seems to call upon his Merzost powers and pulls the blade out unharmed, exclaiming, It will take more than this! So, could Kirigan's words be hinting towards the fate that awaited him in Ruin and Rising, the final book in the Shadow and Bone trilogy, where Alina kills the Darkling when she stabs him with a blade made of Grisha steel? And although Inej loses that dagger during the battle inside the fold, later on Alina gives Inej her own blade as a replacement. There's not much but a fend off a bully or two. I know just what to name it. In the books, Inej names her knives after Ravkan saints, and although she doesn't say it here, we can expect that she'll name the knife Sancta Alina, as she has a knife named that in Six of Crows. I wonder whether the TV show will have Inej kill the Darkling with the blade that Alina gave her, rather than Alina doing it herself as she does in the books. Perhaps Inej failed Failing to kill him the first time around was simply the setup for her succeeding later on, and wouldn't it be poetic if she did it with a knife called Sancta Alina? Another Easter egg for book readers is when Zoya warns Alina about becoming a martyr. So remember this, saints become martyrs before they get to be heroes, so stay alive. That may be hinting at how at the end of Ruin and Rising, Alina fakes her own death. Sancta Alina goes on to become a fabled Ravka martyr, while Alina and Mal each take on new names and go off to live a quiet life together. And if you want to dive deeper into the ending of Shadow and Bone's first season and some season 2 theories, including whether Mal has secret Grisha powers, tap here to watch that video or follow the links in the video description. As we can see, a lot of attention and detail has been put into the show, and the costumes are no exception. For example, the thorn patterns on the Grisha Kefters are a reference to Lee Bardugo's The Language of Thorns book, which is a collection of Grisha folk tales. The embroidery on Alina's kefter forms a sun symbol, which is similar to the sun summoner sunburst symbol used to represent her elsewhere in the show. And Moritzova's stag antlers form a similar sun symbol, referencing why Alina has always felt connected to the stag through her dreams, and also why it bestowed its power on her. And Shadwin Bone even worked with linguist David Peterson to create several original languages on the show, including developing the Ravkan, Fjordan, and Kirch languages we hear. Peterson's perhaps best known for developing the Dothraki language used in Game of Thrones. And in a humorous meta moment, the book that David throws at Jesper when the crows are kicking him out of his carriage is a Ravkan version of Bardugo's Shadow and Bone book that was specially made for the show. He threw a book at me. I'm looking forward to season two, and I'm curious to see how Kirigan will track down Alina and Mal, though with his Grisha spies everywhere, he'll doubtless soon be on their trail. And if you're looking to keep your own online trail private and secure from snoopers and spies, do check out a long-time sponsor of our channel, NordVPN. If you spend time on 
online, chatting on social media, or watching videos and TV, then a VPN is an essential tool to keep all of your activity private. By creating an encrypted connection for all your online activity, a virtual private network will prevent your internet service provider from tracking the sites you visit and sharing your data with governments or even selling it to advertisers. Here at Flix in the City, we've tested many VPNs and we know some can really slow down your connection. However, when we tested NordVPN, we were able to get blisteringly fast download and upload speeds. On top of that, NordVPN helps you connect to many streaming services and navigate around any blocks to your favourite TV shows if they aren't available in your country. Just use the simple app to pick a country, click, and then you can browse the internet as if you were there. With Nord, you can connect up to six devices at any one time, including your laptop, tablet, and phone. So you can keep your mobile devices safe whenever you're using public Wi-Fi. Right now, we have an exclusive offer for all our viewers. Get a two-year plan plus one month with 70% off. Just visit nordvpn.com slash flicks or tap the link in the video description to access the offer. Visit nordvpn.com slash flicks to grab yourself a huge 70% discount. So what other details or easter eggs did you spot in Shadow and Bone? And what are your favourite moments or theories about the show? Comment with your thoughts below and if you enjoyed this video, a thumbs up and a share are hugely appreciated. Tap left for my next Shadow and Bone video or tap right for something else you're sure to like. Thanks for watching and see you next time, yippee ki movie lovers!